Before we go into the main museum mansion, let's look at some of the buildings and places on the grounds of the museum, such as this very large building, which is the Polson Museum Railroad Camp. Inside, you'll find some very impressive large equipment and machinery that was either used uh, in logging, some by the Polson Company, and or uh, manufactured in Grays Harbor. This Lynn tractor truck was first used at Grand Coulee Dam and then purchased by the Polson Logging Company and was recently restored so that it could be in the Loggers Play Day Parade. Another featured vehicle is this number 45 engine that is fully dismantled now and being restored so that it looks like maybe doesn't function like its original self. This very large lathe is truly impressive and as we walk through the building uh, up the stairs there is a lamb speed track which was built in Grace Harbor. It's probably the only one still in existence today. You can see how it operated on the video that plays in um, right next to it. And very large logs were cut into either 24 by 24 or 36 by 36 squares and shipped to Japan. Um, that way they didn't roll on the, uh, on the ships. This large saw, it's what was formerly used to saw the very big logs. And you can kind of see some of the operating things. And leaning against the wall are some of the hand planed boards. Leaving the museum railroad camp, as we scan across the grounds, we see two donkey engines used in logging, and then the rose garden, which is where the parents, Alex and Ella Polson, lived. Their mansion was torn down when uh, Ella Polson decided no one else should live there and she moved to the Emerson Hotel. But walking through the Rose Garden is a pleasant experience and definitely worth a, a little stroll. At the end of the walkway in the Rose Garden is a Grand Army of the Republic uh, monument. Then in back of the Rose Garden is the Polson Camp blacksmith shop. It's a replica and unfortunately the little building is being uh, pushed by a very large tree which is behind it. And yes, the Polson Museum and grounds are on the um, 
Historic Preservation. So it's a registered National Historic Place. And now let's go in. Good afternoon. John Larson here with the Polson Museum. Why don't you come on in, we'll give a tour today. So I'm here with Mary Lou Gregory today on the 10th of October, 2021. And we wanted to do a little walkthrough of the mansion today, show you a little bit of the work that we've been up to here during the last two pandemic closures in 2020 and 21. And you may have already seen, or you're about to see some still footage of, of the inside of our mansion, but I thought it would be fun to give you a little narration of the work that we've been work, uh, doing here to restore this old building. And just briefly, the building we're in was the home of Arnold and Priscilla Polson. Who were the heirs to the Polson Logging Company. Their home, built in 1924, designed by the Seattle architect, a man named Arthur Loveless, and built by the local builder, Ben Brunstadt, throughout the year 1924. The house itself was their residence through the mid-1960s and then was left vacant between 1965 and 1976. And then it was finally turned into a museum in 77 with the help of a lot of volunteers from the community to build a local history museum for Grace Harbor's history. But during the time since 1977, there had been very little work done on the interior of the building. And with the first closure in March of 2020, due to COVID-19, we thought what a perfect opportunity to do restoration work to the inside of this building that we couldn't really do with visitors here during our normal open hours. So I just kind of walk you through and give a little sense of what all we were able to accomplish during the two closures. The first one, in starting again starting in March of 2020, we focused, not knowing how long that closure would last, on beginning with the second dining room. And so why don't we walk right on through into that dining room and what I thought to accomplish in that effort was mainly to get ultraviolet light filtration on the windows, but happily, uh, well, not happily for the pandemic's sake, but happily for the museum's sake, we were able to accomplish a whole lot more than that. And that involves stripping off all the original wallpaper in each room. This is the main dining room. We finished this later, but come on into the second dining room down this way. This was what we call the breakfast room. And the breakfast room was one where the Polson family would have met at a smaller gathering table, uh, but it was where all their fancy dishware was housed. Uh, we were able to repurpose our original photos from the Jones photo collection into new labels, which give a lot more context to each room in this reincarnated exhibit that we've come up with. But I'll tell you what, this took a lot of effort. Every single door had to come off every single hinge came off, every single handle came off, and we repainted everything here. So this was a, a really trim intensive room. A peek inside the cupboard shows some of the dishes owned by the Polson family, and also donations from people in the community, uh, such as one by Marjorie Stage, who was a charter member of Beta Ta Beta Chi, and also commemorative plates showing locations in our community. Um, again, as I mentioned, we added ultraviolet light filtration to all the windows. We added, there had actually been a kind of a broken piece in here. We re-added that back. And then every single piece of hardware got polished. So it took us a lot of effort in each room. This particular space was about a three week effort alone. And then once we were done here, we proceeded on to the next. So during that first closure, we finished this room, the library, we worked on the guest dressing room upstairs, and we also finished the foyer, stairwell, and landing. And we'll take a walk through that next, uh, just to kind of give a sense of how big that space was to deal with. The the foyer had, if you have been here in the last 40 years, you might remember some of the floral wallpaper panels, or they were kind of a pastoral scene with trees and 
some people in them, some horses, cows. Uh, that was all put in in 1977. And we used a steam machine to physically remove all that wallpaper and then begin the process of restoring the plastered walls, which took a lot of mud work, a lot of sanding, um, fi finished with primer and then two coats of top coat. And our goal was to use these original photos again, going back to the Polson's day here, where we would look at these original pictures, analyze the walls for what was on them, and in most cases, in almost every case actually, of the 1942 photos, were solid wall colors. And that was our goal, was to get back as close to the 1924 period as we could with this restoration. So the room we're in now, we started this last November on the second pandemic closure. This was the formal dining room. And this room had a wallpaper that was kind of a flocked, almost a velvety velour type material on it. That got steamed off and we went right back to that solid wall color, clean trim, uh, really made it look nice. As you see though, we're a little sparse on our exhibits and that's a project that we're gonna be working towards beginning in the new year, 2022, with a closure beginning on January 1st and then plan to last until April 2nd, in which we will do a full redo of our main permanent exhibits. On the wall in the main dining room, you may have noticed a colorful circle. That is a piper board, and that was uh, something the kids did around Grays Harbor in the 60s. Uh, they were even featured in uh, Life magazine with their piper boards. Another fascinating artifact in the main dining room is the Poulsen's Victrola, and this is one of the things that actually did belong to them. Uh, it's a pretty fancy uh, version of a Victrola. I think we're used to the tall ones. There's one of those up in the upstairs of the museum. But this one was purchased uh, by the Polsons uh, from Richardson's in Los Angeles. And there are even some of the needles that would have been used for the 78 RPM records. So we're kind of excited to be offering new content about Grace Harbor history in that process. So we will be closed to the public full time for three months but we think it's gonna be a really uh, a great way to re-energize the museum with our new 2022 and on into the future. So we'll head to the foyer next. And as I mentioned, this was done in that earlier closure, again in 2020, and it was going through every bit of detail with all the switch plate covers coming off and getting repolished with taking every bit of furniture out of this space and painting all the trim redoing all the walls we worked our way into the public restroom we finished all the doors so every door came off of the building and we set up tables throughout all this space to redo all the refinishing of the doors uh, all the hardware, again, the, the hinges, the door plates, this, you know, all this stuff came off and got polished. I'll just poke you into the library. We're actually having this closed to the public right now because we needed space for some of the new donations that had come in during the closure. The stairwell going up to the second story was especially labor intensive because of the detail to paint all the rungs here, which of course were double coated. Everything is double coated with paint. Uh, but the accuracy with which to avoid getting on, you know, raw wood or unfinished uh, wood as opposed to the paint with quite a lot of steady hands here. So it was quite a job. Uh, while we're on the first floor, I'm gonna walk into the gift shop. Uh, well, what was the gift shop? We've actually changed the configuration of the museum some. So this was the, the main living room here. We actually did not have to restore this room because this one was one of the few that had been done prior to the pandemic closure. So we left this alone. But the sunroom, which had been our gift shop previously, was one that had not been touched for a lot of years, of course. And this took a whole lot of trim paint. There are 140 individual window panes in this room. 
and all that requires a double coat of trim. And to do this, we decided to use an airless sprayer. So we set up, masked the whole room off, and shot everything. And that worked out pretty well, actually. You get a nice finish, and it went pretty quick. Uh, problem is wet paint on cold glass does tend to sag, so we had to do some extra cleanup on that. But, uh, but the finished product was fantastic. And it allowed us then to do a full cleanup of all that, a lot of scraping to get the paint off, and then adhere ultraviolet light filtration on every single window, not only in this room, but in every room throughout the entire mansion. So as a museum, trying to keep that harmful ultraviolet ray away from the artifacts, we finally achieved full coverage throughout the building, which is a big, big improvement for us, and we're really happy to report that. The walls here again have the the uh, striped wallpaper that had been put on in the 1970s and we steamed all that off and then wound up going back with the primer and the two coats and a lot of mud work to get all the cracking and uh, in some cases large chunks of missing plaster repaired but we did restore every bit of that plaster to a very clean and beautiful state. So our goal with this room is to not have it as a gift shop again. This is now an exhibit room and we haven't fully finished setting up all the labeling on this, but we are gonna use this as a showcase for now for the new artifacts that come into the mansion, come into the collection. And in particular, during the pandemic period, we had a lot of donors from throughout Grace Harbor and beyond who had been cleaning up their own places and finding things that they felt were worthy of our museum's collection. And we were able to select quite a number of those to be added to the permanent collection. So things from Aberdeen's Golden Jubilee to a canal that never was built in the 1930s proposed to come go from Grace Harbor to Olympia and uh, of course connect with the Columbia via the ocean. Uh, some really nice pieces from Fred Straub jewelry, uh, dog tags from individuals. We had original pins from the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, this is some nice little bottle here that came from one of the local taverns. Um, various ephemera from other Grace Harbor businesses. So, just a sampling of things that we took in during the closure. Well, let's take a walk upstairs briefly, and I'll show you some of the projects that we accomplished up there. Um, we spent a lot of time in the upstairs doing restoration work just because so much of that had not been done previous to this. Prior to the pandemic closures, this room that I'm in now, the living room, the kitchen, the master bathroom, the master sitting room, and I'm trying to think if there was one other. I there was one bedroom upstairs. Those are the only rooms in the house that we had previously restored. The rest of it was completely done during 2020 and 2021. About the time the pandemic broke out, the Polson Museum had a wonderful exhibit of sports items from the Smithsonian. And their obligation, the museum's obligation, was to have local sports items also to be exhibited along with the Smithsonian exhibit. Since then, the uh, Smithsonian exhibit ended, but the living room and part of the dining room still has um, items, local items uh, about sports, connected with sports and um, there are a lot of fun things here to look at. Let's go to the kitchen where the appliances are also interesting to look at. Here's the refrigerator that was a gift of the Derny family. And around the corner from that is the stove, which has uh, one original burner in the back. 
And this interesting item in the cupboard, which uh, is what you use to open canned milk, or was in the past. There's a stand mixer that looks like a forebearer of the, the current ones. And there uh, is a dishwasher, which doesn't operate, but still looks interesting. Here are some butter churns and ice tongs for when the ice man brought ice to the ice box. And also this hand plow and cedar are hanging in the, in the, uh, from the ceiling. Then as we go upstairs, we see this elevator that is similar to the one the Polsons had installed in the stairwell of their home. So here we are in the stairwell landing on the second floor, and this again was kind of a continuation of the entryway, the foyer entry, where we again steamed off two layers of wallpaper, completely restored the walls, all the trim painting again, and it allowed us to really bring this back to a state of beauty. It had been pretty, pretty rough looking. The wallpaper had cracked, a lot of damage to various parts. We had some water damage that had occurred to the wall from a roof tear off years ago and all that got repaired. So the space itself, again, we, we don't fully have it set up with our exhibits. Again, that's to happen in 2022, but we have at least gotten some of our pieces hung. The goal with this space is to have a real showcase here of some of our, our prized, most prized artifacts. That's kind of the, the gems of the collection is the goal. So everything from our railroad cycle to some of our better panoramas, uh, big scale there from Land Grace Harbor. We're just starting to set up some of the items that'll be showcased here and more broadly and, and appropriately interpreted. When we began work again on this second closure of the pandemic in 2021, uh, rather in November of 2020, leading into 2021, the big jobs were tackling the room with the model railroad and the dressing room. So we'll head in there next and show you that. The room we're walking through now was previously restored, so we didn't have to do too much in here. This was the master sitting room. In a small closet in this room, you will see an exhibit giving a nod to the brothels that were on Grays Harbor. And uh, with items that might have been there, such as cork boots and a spittoon, and uh, delicate ladies' slippers and a wash basin. These places had notorious names and infamous addresses. But the room where the model railroad is, if you step in here, was quite a challenge. This involved tinting the entire model railroad with a plastic cover to keep the dust and debris out of it because the ceiling here had really suffered a lot of damage to the plaster. And we didn't quite get a perfect job on it, but we sure did a, a much better and improved job from what it had been. It allowed us to put up new track lighting, which I think does a, a much better job of illuminating things. And then again, restoring all the walls, taking off the wallpaper and redoing all the trim paint throughout. But, uh, we physically had to rig the railroad with a winch system to pull it away from the back wall that allowed us to get behind the railroad to restore the walls and so forth back there. So it was quite a, quite a job. Let's just take a little while to watch the electric trains go around on the track and see some of the scenery that they're passing through.
This room, the master bedroom, leads into the master dressing room. And this was probably uh, the second biggest project of the upstairs because it involves so much trim. And during the Poulsen's time here, these doors would have had a wood face door on them. But we were able to completely go through and put new trim paint on everything. And this was the only other room that we used the airless sprayer in. But it involved taking off every single door, every single knob, every single hinge, and completely masking the rest of the room, and then running through with the airless sprayer to shoot the whole thing with double coats of trim paint. Quite a job. It was a real mess for in its uh, in its peak point of, of work here. We also added a new light fixture here. This had come out of an old house on J Street. Um, again, some of the fixtures from the Pulses day here had been removed long ago, and we did our best to bring it back to a 1920s look, even if it wasn't exactly what the Pulsons had. But the space here turned out just beautiful, really, and our exhibits were really excited about. We don't have all of our interpretation up, but we are now showcasing uh, a much less cluttered look to some of the clothing collections that we have. Uh, the process, I should mention, of going through the house and restoring each room involved physically removing every single artifact from every single storage spot and then going through and cataloging that. And I'd like to give a shout out to our collections manager, Irene Kennedy, whose job it was to do with all the collection end of things. And it was just an exhaustive process to go through and document, weed out the things that didn't belong here, do a better job of storing the things that do, and then finally, in this case, setting up a really beautiful display. Irene went through our hat collection in this particular room. We've got a sampling of those over here. I wanna say there was something like 170 plus hats that we had to go through and catalog. Um, we didn't wind up keeping every last one of those, but the majority of them we did. Again, in this room, <clears throat> Like every room, we added the ultraviolet light filtration, so now we're, we're keeping out the harmful UV rays. But we also got rid of some of the awkward window coverings that had been here, which affords a much more beautiful view of the natural setting of the mansion in relation to the Hoquiam River. And we're really excited to be able to offer that to visitors when they come here and just really get to experience the views that the Polson had uh, when they lived here. And in this case, if you're looking straight out across the river, you look right at their office, which was the building that uh, you see directly across and kind of the tan brick. Yeah, so let's, uh, let's take a little walk down to the bedrooms and that'll complete our tour here. But we, again, had two coats of wallpaper. All that had to come off. It had a really ugly looking 1970s era track lighting. We have now replaced all that. But worst of all, the two bedrooms, either direction, had this really heavily textured ceiling mud that had been put on in a certain time period, 70s, 80s. And we used a steam machine to scrape off every last bit of that and bring back these smooth finished ceilings that would have been original to the house. So again, this room's a little sparse right now. We're, we're not yet done with the permanent exhibits, but it's way less cluttered and it has, again, clean walls. Uh, this room took a lot of wall restoration work. We weren't perfect with all of it, but uh, a lot of damage here around the, the fireplace. But again, we're able to show off the fireplace. This had been previously covered up with some uh, display cases in front of it. And we've made a real attempt to not clutter the house with things in front of windows and so forth. The last thing we haven't finished, which we're about to, uh, in the next couple weeks, wrap up, are the two French doors that go here in front of this baluster. And this, without them, leaves a pretty nice view of our project house next door, which I'll look forward to giving you all a tour of that at some point. The little house is, a, is an ongoing project we call the Hubble House. It's at 1607 Riverside Avenue. And that space is to be our paper-based archive and wood shop and future public meeting space. One so two rooms that were never restored during the Polson's day here. And one is my office, which uh, is here. 
but the space that the servants used for piling linens. This would have been a linen closet. And we thought with the glass, it would be an excellent way to show off the space, but also our entire Native American basket collection. And just kind of a little nugget at the end of the hallway when you get down here to, to be able to take a time warp back into the 1920s and see how the Polson's uh, colors and choices of, of uh, interior finishes were, were done. So yeah, I think that uh, that concludes our little journey through the building at the moment, but we look forward to welcoming you in person. We are open now through the end of the year on a full-time schedule, Wednesday to Sunday, but we are gonna close again in the beginning of the year for those three months. And next summer should be a great time to visit when we have our exhibits finished and everything back into a, a real robust museum active standpoint. So thanks for watching.